Hi, I'm Kevin Clare from the University of Minnesota. Thanks for joining us today on this webinar. We're going to be talking a little bit about foreign financial management in the United States. Appreciate your participation. And just so you know who you're uh, meeting with today, here's a picture of me. We're going to quickly go past that and talk about uh, a little bit about myself. I'm from Minnesota, from the University of Minnesota, as I stated. So on the U.S. map here, you can see where Minnesota is. It's in the center of the country, up against the Canadian border. And yes, it is cold in Minnesota in the wintertime. Um, glad to be here in Geelong, where it's not so cold in the wintertime. You have beautiful weather here. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and be joining you today. A little bit about uh, Minnesota and my background. Minnesota is a a large agricultural state, as you can see here on the graph. It is the fourth largest uh, producer of agricultural products by dollar volume. We are surpassed only by California, Iowa, and Nebraska. So we sell about $22 billion worth of agricultural products out of Minnesota each year. And this is a, a map of Minnesota. The southern part of the state is very much in the corn and what we call the corn and soybean belt which is kind of across the Midwest, it's our most productive land. As you go into northwest Minnesota, we're getting a little too far north uh, for corn and soybeans, and uh, the northwest corner of the state is very much wheat and barley. Um, there's kind of a dairy belt that goes through the state, and we also have a lot of, of, um, of hogs, turkeys, and beef. The northeast part of the state, there's no, almost no agriculture. That's forestry and mining. So that's kind of a quick overview of Minnesota, and you'll see the red metro area uh, on the on the right hand side there. That's uh, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, a metro area of about three and a half million people. So we also have that in the state. I work at the Center for Farm Financial Management. It's in the Department of Applied Economics, again at the University of Minnesota. Our center is a um, self-supporting center within the university. We get about 5% of our budget from the university. The other 95% we have to generate, so we are more like a small business in some sense operating out of the University, out of, the university of Minnesota. Uh, we sell or develop software products. We sell software products. We also have uh, we develop a lot of websites, and those are mostly free, so we have lots of free products also. but um, we do have to generate money, so we sell both uh, software products and educational programming. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the U.S. right now and, and some of the tools that we've developed that, to respond to some of these topics. Some of the hot topics right now are the growing financial stress. We've come out of probably the best decade in agriculture, maybe not decade, maybe seven, eight years of agriculture that we've experienced in anyone's lifetime at least in the U.S. I know that uh, in Australia here in some places that there was a drought during some of those good years and so you didn't necessarily get to participate in all the benefits. But in the U.S. the last seven, eight years, for crops at least, we've had the highest commodity prices with generally good yields. So we've had uh, record um, profitability in agriculture. That's changed. The last two years commodity prices have dropped. They're about half of what they were two and a half years ago. And as we work through the uh, liquidity, the, the working capital of producers, the financial stress is just starting to really uh, emerge. Probably over the next six to nine months, we're going to uh, have a lot of very hard discussions between producers and their bankers, and um, not everyone will get financing. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the financial stress in the U.S. and what we're, uh, some of the tools and ways we're going to look at that. Another big topic is transitioning farmers. We have a lot of farmers, as do you, who are um, getting towards retirement and who's going to uh, operate the farm. Is it the next generation or is it someone else? And how do you transition that farm to the next generation? And then another topic that gives a lot of attention these days in the U.S. is beginning farmers. And that, again, goes back to the, kind of connected to the transitioning farmer topic is uh, who are those beginning farmers? Where are they coming from? How can we help them get established? So with that, I'm going to start out by talking about the emerging financial stress. This is a chart of um, farm net farm income over the last almost 20 years in the U.S. or actually in Minnesota, but it's very reflective of the whole country. And you can see starting about uh, 2002, 2001, 
we had a um, just increasing profitability almost every year except for that one aberration in 2009. So we've had, and several of those years we had record profits. When we hit 2007, we thought that was that was record profits. We never had profits on a per farm basis like that before. And for the most part, it just kept climbing up through 2012. But then look at the last two years. We've just crashed in terms of farm uh, profitability. And I'm going to show you the next slide. Uh, this is breaking that out by type of farm. So the blue line is crop farms, red line is hog farms, green dairy, and black beef. Or prim Those are the primary. They're mixed, mixed farms, but that's the primary enterprise. You'll notice that crop farms where that uh, blue line started to come down in 2013 continued to come down. So on the previous slide where I sh it was 40 some thousand dollars with a net farm income, that's across all types of farms. Most of that was because of the livestock sector that's done really well the last two years with high beef prices, relatively high hog prices and pretty good dairy uh, income. So all three of those livestock sectors have gone back up, whereas crops have continued to drop. So our financial stress is really in the crop sector, uh, which is by far our biggest sector. And so we're uh, looking at many farms, most farms having negative profit margins last year and even more so this year. Obviously, farm profitability is never evenly distributed. So this graph shows the top 20%, the green line, the average of all farms, the blue line, and then the red line, the average of the um, poorest performing 20% of farms. <clears throat> so there are farms that are still making lots of money. The average uh, median net farm income for 2014 for the top 20% was about $300,000. So obviously some farms doing well, <coughs> excuse me, and some not doing so well. There's always farms that are struggling. That red line for the last 20 years has always, almost always been uh, negative. That's not the same farms, thankfully, year to year. It's different farms. If you stayed down there for several years, you wouldn't be in business anymore. So it, it's not the same farms staying in these top 20 or bottom 20 uh, sectors. So what's happening? We have a lot lower commodity prices. You know that. You're experiencing the same thing here in Australia. About half of what they were for a wheat or for maize or for soybeans. And what's on the other side of the equation, we have really sticky input prices right now. Our fertilizer, seed, chemicals costs are not coming down. And in the U.S., we rent a lot of land, so a lot of the land is leased. Over 50% of our land that is farmed is leased land, and our rental rates are not coming down either. And that's probably the biggest, uh, one of the biggest costs, and it's the one that everyone expects that will, should and will have to come down, but it hasn't come down much yet. And then the third factor, um, increasing interest rates. We have not yet seen increasing interest rates, but it's always looming on the horizon that uh, one of these months, the Federal Reserve will increase interest rates. Everyone expected it last year and certainly this year. And now um, still anticipation that interest rates will start increasing in sometime either in September, or December, which will cause uh, a little bit more challenges in the finan uh, farm financials perspective. And then on the, on the bottom half of this screen, residual from the boom years. We uh, had so many good years that farmers and lenders and farm consultants, everybody working in, the, in agriculture, we just got lax in our financial management. We didn't have to push the numbers as hard. We didn't have to uh, control costs as well. And so we kind of got into an uh, era of lax financial management. A lot more money was going to capital investments, um, upgrading machinery, upgrading buildings, um, just a lot of capital investment was going on. And family living crept up. You ha we had money. Family living expenses went up. Family living expenses are very hard to pull back down once they've gone up. And we had easy credit. Uh, in fact, many lenders were concerned that there wasn't enough money being borrowed, that their businesses were being uh, hurt a little bit because farmers had so much cash they weren't borrowing money and so they were looking for customers. Credit was fairly easy and the same thing that when we talk about lax financial management, the, the lenders weren't asking for as much information uh, when they were making loans and so all of this is now um, something that we kind of got to push back against. We need much better financial management going forward. We need, uh, and this has already happened pretty much where the higher capital investments, uh, capital investment has really dried up. Uh, machinery purchase, equipment purchases have 
declined rapidly. We uh, there will probably be pressure on family living expenses. That's uh, probably not happening a lot yet, but we expect it will. And credit will um, the lenders will do a lot more number crunching uh, as they review credit uh, going forward from here. So I want to mention one of the tools that uh, we will we expect to see increased use of during the next uh, six months, 12 months, over the next couple of years, and that's FinPAC. It's a tool that our center, the Center for Foreign Financial Management, uh, developed, and it's kind of like our flagship tool. We uh, built our center around FinPAC. We have a lot of other projects and programs now, but this was our original product and still is our flagship product. We first started developing FinPAC in the late 1970s. We started uh, selling it as a credit analysis loan review uh, tool to banks in 1982. In the 1980s, it uh, expanded from Minnesota to become a national program. It was used across the entire U.S. Uh, during the farm financial crisis years of the 1980s by farm consultants, by the extension service, by our uh, agricultural universities. And at that point, we probably had 1,500 um, lenders, or not lenders, um, consultants and educators using FinPAC. Over the years, use by consultants and, and educators has, has dropped off somewhat. We just don't have as many extension educators left in the United States. So we're probably down to 1,000 uh, people like that using this software. But use by uh, lenders for credit analysis has uh, increased a lot. We probably have about 14, 1,500 lenders using it right now for uh, credit reviews. That represents between 250 and 300 uh, banks. And obviously, we have a lot more banks, smaller banks in the United States than you have here in Australia. So I just want to talk about FinPAC a little bit and how it will um, potentially be a tool uh, that will, again, uh, get more use during the next few years with the foreign financial stress. That's not to say it doesn't get a lot of use now. Um, the people that are using that, that uh, group of lenders and consultants extension probably use FinPAC. We estimate and um, sometimes do surveys with between 50,000 and 80,000 producers a year right now. So uh, when I talk about increased use, um, it will increase, but it's still it's um, a program that gets a lot of use already. So this is, uh, we do market it to banks. Uh, this is one of our advertisements to banks. And uh, just a list of some of the tools, the agricultural tools in FinPAC. Obviously, we have balance sheets, and if you drop down a few lines, uh, we do cash flow projections, both annual and monthly. Uh, we also do, which is not on this list, a what-if component within FinPAC. What if I want to buy more land or rent land or I want to get into a new enterprise or I want to do a big expansion? Uh, that what-if tool lets you evaluate um, the potential for profitability and repayment ability if you do that. There's also then a lot of lender tools in it, risk rating, collateral analysis, a loan presentation uh, package, uh, global cash flow analysis, which is growing in use in the U.S. where it's looking at all the various entities. So many farmers these days have multiple entities and they have partners and investors. And so it looks at the uh, financial picture of all the entities and investors and partners. Um, so that's kind of the list of ag tools. We have expanded a uh, FinPAC out to commercial uh, credit analysis also for non-ag businesses. Uh, so we do develop this list of ag tools. Uh, but the primary, the, the uh, historic uh, three big tools within FinPAC before we started adding on all the lending tools. Uh, one of them is, is what we call FinFlow. It's a cash flow planning tool uh, used by lenders a lot to just look at next year and the, uh, what they need for operating loans and repayment capacity. But also if uh, you're looking at an expansion or a change in the business that kind of steps through month by month, if you can handle the expansion, does project operating loan needs. You can do monthly or annual plans for up to 10 years. It's not used a lot um, out that far, but not uncommon to see a two or three year cash flow projection. And it does project uh, inventories, not just cash, but also inventories of crop and livestock inventories on a monthly basis going forward. Another tool within FinPAC uh, is FinAN. It's a financial year-end analysis, looks back at the previous year, takes all the record keeping and, and puts it into a financial analysis, either on a whole farm basis 
or on an enterprise analysis, which is enterprise by enterprise, or even down to evaluating individual fields if you have the data to do that. FinPAC is really not a record or accounting system is at all. We kind of look at it sometimes as the bookend student accounting system. It's the financial planning at the beginning of the year and then the financial analysis at the end of the year, bringing more um, usability to the rec accounting system data. And then again, the, another tool is the financial long-range budgeting, which is that what-if tool I mentioned earlier. What if I want to look at an expansion or um, change in enterprises or anything else? Uh, what would the debt repayment ability and the net worth growth profitability be if I made that expansion? So I'm going to do a quick look at FinPAC just to give you a sense of what it might look like. This is not an uh, overview of FinPAC uh, as, as, as a whole by any means. FinPAC, uh, we generally spend two days uh, doing a FinPAC training session. So this is going to be a five-minute brief, quick tour into FinPAC. I'm just going to open up a file. The parts of FinPAC, we have data sources, which are basically we drive all the data, or not all the data, a lot of the data from balance sheets and from tax returns. The financial analysis, we do have three different tools. Uh, the full financial analysis, which I just mentioned, uh, we can also take our uh, farm tax returns, which are cash-based, and, and turn those into accrual uh, income statements. And then if the simplest one is an earned net worth analysis, which, which, analysis, which just takes a beginning and ending balance sheet, adds some, a few additional numbers, and we do a derived net worth um, change and a derived net farm income from that. For projections, we do the, uh, a monthly cash flow. We can do an annual cash flow, which is much simpler, or we can do that long-range what-if plan. Uh, credit analysis, we can do a collateral analysis. Uh, we do risk rating. We don't have one in FinPAC. We let the lender set up their own, we, and they, it just grabs data from within FinPAC. And then the loan presentation module. So I'm just going to click into balance sheets and uh, show you a little bit of functionality. We do save all the data from a farmer within one data file. And these are the input sections over here on the left. I'll click into just current assets. You can just uh, start filling in numbers at the main level here or any place where a number turns blue. There's detail behind there. And so you have always the option to add in detail and uh, go as deep as you want in terms of data entry. This would list all your of banking accounts. That's similar for prepaid expenses and it's always customized to that particular data entry. On, on loans, we're asking for a lot of information on loans because like I said, this is data entry. We're gathering data on the loans that will flow through the other parts of FinPAC. It has all kinds of tools built into it like full loan calculator. Many of you are familiar with that. And then at any time you can just click to view the output and it will take you to the output. We put as much information as we can on the executive summary page of the balance sheet, calculate the net worth, have a signature block, and then all the other information is stored in schedules like you would see with just about any other balance sheet. And again, we can return to input with a click of just one click there. I'm gonna get out of the balance sheet. I'm gonna spend a couple of seconds in a monthly cash flow and then we'll look at the loan presentation manager and that will be it. So I'm just going to look at the output of our cash flow. We do an executive summary page on our cash flow, which is calculates net cash flow. We do a projected change in working capital, which just brings in the inventory changes together with cash. We do a projected uh, income, projected earned net worth change, uh, the term debt coverage ratio. And then in the U.S., we have what's called the Farm Financial Standards Council, which um, set standards for how ratios are calculated and which ratios we're going to use in agriculture. It's been very uh, advantageous to have that council, and we follow the guidelines of the council very closely. So we re or print on this summary page the 21 ratios recommended by the Farm Financial Standards Council. In the very bottom here, we can do shock testing. And so if uh, you can set these shocks at whatever you want up under tools, we just have them set at 10% decrease in income, a 10% increase in expenses, or a 3% change in interest rates, and what would happen to the term debt coverage ratio from how much would it change uh, from what we are projecting up here 
if nothing happened, if it was just the way we were planning. If we continue on down, it's just a very simple cash flow like you would be used to, monthly inflows, monthly outflows, uh, any new credit, any loan payments, and then what essentially the bottom section is what you would look at as a line of credit. It has the uh, beginning, beginning annual operating loan balance coming in from the balance sheet. Anytime there's a surplus, it will pay off the interest and then the principal on that annual operating loan. Anytime there would be a deficit, which we don't see much of here until way out into November, it would add to the operating loan. If it actually had a, a carrying an operating loan across all the months, you could see peak operating loan needs and how much the operating loan need uh, loan potentially could be here. It peaks actually in January, so the operating loan would be somewhat over two hundred thousand dollars. And that'd be the peak for the year. And it does show it as basically primarily getting repaid. So it does show repayment ability. And we do track, uh, like I said, projected inventory changes throughout the year. In this case for corn or maize, uh, beginning balance off the balance sheet, how much is fed, when it's sold, when it's being produced, and just a running inventory for both crops and livestock. The last thing I wanted to show is just the presentation manager. This is for a loan officer working with a producer and then wanting to put together a presentation to take to the loan review committee. It is grabbing uh, data from throughout FinPAC, so it takes a few seconds to load. And I'm not exactly sure what just happened there. Uh, here we go. So I'm going to go into the main document. We do not, again, just like our risk rating, we don't send uh, a, a presentation template out with FinPAC or we just let each bank build their own or we build them for them and they can put in whatever top or sections they want so they can put in headings like purpose of request and sources of repayment and then below that it becomes a word processor so I'm just going to retype that and I'll come back to that in a minute uh, you can insert tables and so we have a present and proposed loan table we have a collateral analysis table you can just when you do the uh, setup for your bank or for whatever uh, you choose what tables you want to come into the loan presentation you can choose which ratios or ratio table you want to set up and then I think on this one there's a few more sections um, that this bank sample bank chose to put in there so I had typed up here the current ratio is well, one of the powerful features of FinPAC and particularly the loan presentation is I can just go over here to the right and grab data from all kinds of different sources. So I want to get the current ratio off the balance sheet. Just go over here and click on current ratio and it drops that right into my text. So I'm doing a write up here. My numbers can drop right in. And then if I come back the following year, all I need to do is update wherever my sources of data are. So the balance sheet, the cash flow, the tax return, whatever it might be, update these with a um, just pick which one I'm looking at, come back to the main document. All the numbers in this document then are updated. Whatever I inserted, all the ones in tables or ratios, they're all automatically updated from the, the new balance sheet, the new cash flows, risk rating, whatever I'm grabbing data from. And then all I need to do as a lender is check my text and, and rewrite my text to reflect the uh, situation for the next year. So FinPAC is really designed to streamline and, and, and gain efficiencies uh, both for the farmer themselves, because farmers do use FinPAC themselves if they want to be on top of their finances, for consultants working with farmers and preparing documents for a lender or helping farmers understand their finances, and then for the lender to uh, you know work as quickly as they can with really good information. And we do have a lot of synergy going on. We have uh, educators or consultants using FinPAC. We have individual farmers. And they bring data into the bank, and, and there's a lot of data sharing that goes on in that respect in some parts of the U.S., not across, not everywhere. So that was a quick tour of FinPAC. We're going to move on with, uh, with the presentation. And I want to talk a bit about benchmarking. We have um, put a lot of resources into benchmarking, and the reason we've done it is we really think that um, – I'm going to talk a little about farm management associations where we get our benchmarking data. We think what the farm management associations in the U.S. are doing with both helping farmers with their financial planning and analysis and then with benchmarking may be the most valuable thing that uh, or useful thing that farmers can do to, to increase their profits. 
So I'm going to talk through how we do that in the U.S. a little bit, um, not saying you should do it. I know you do benchmarking here, and you certainly do a lot of financial planning and analysis just to uh, show you what we're doing and compare it and, and maybe generate an idea here in Australia. So we have what's called FinBIN. It's the uh, largest publicly available database of farm financial data in the U.S. We have about 4,000 farms in FinBIN uh, representing farms from 10 states. We don't have data from a, the whole country. We'd like to, but we don't. Uh, but the 10 states that bring data in here do represent about 4,000 farms with complete financial data. It's not survey data. It's actual data from farms. I'm going to actually go into FinBIN and show two. So I just switched over to the web here and show two uh, ways of looking at data. So I'm going to go into a crop farm here and these are, this is just a list of crops represented that we have data for. I'm going really fast, I know you can't read that. That we have data for in FinBin. So lots of crops. Uh, we can choose which state we want to look at a report. I'm gonna leave it at all states, but these are the states that have data in the system. And then we can, and we could go down and actually look at an individual state or even a county within a state if there's enough data. There has to be a minimum number of farms for that region. But what this lets us do is a very dynamic database. It lets us, a farmer, look at a set of farms that are his peers. So it's the same type of farm, let's say it's a dairy farm or a crop farm, raising the same products in the same region and potentially at the same size. So we can look at um, output by enterprise size, by net returns, across years. I'm just going to grab net returns uh, and we can, if we really wanted to, we could sort down and look by uh, production systems, tillage systems, row width, um, organic or non-organic. Um, there's all kinds of options. I'm just going to click on generate a report. Those are all the data sources and here's the report. So we, the report I just got on corn or maize is from 2,700 fields, 1,600 farms. When we, I said split it into by net uh, income, so it's got the low 20% up to the high 20% and shows the cost of production. The income, cost of production, and finally, the uh, cost of production in our system per bushel. So that's one way of looking at the data. I want to grab a different type of report which we call percentile or uh, benchmarking reports. And uh, let me actually go into livestock, show something different here. I'll uh, take dairy and I'll take the full report and let's just generate a dairy report for 2014. See what happens. So this is for just under 500 farms. And the way this report is structured, it's breaking the data into percentiles every 10%. And so the, always to the right, 100% is the best, and the left, the 10% is the worst. And so it lets you look at, if you had your own farm data, where you fall in this report. Now the advantage of being in a farm management association actually contributing data to FinBin is that it would highlight where you are in this report. Anybody can use it. It's open to the public. It's used by producers, by a lots of educators by the media and even by uh, some of our political people to look at reports. So this is available to anybody, but let me get out of here and just show you what kind of report you would get this report if you were actually contributing data to FinPen or FinBin. And then it would highlight your numbers like this in yellow. So you can quickly generate a report like this and see where your strengths are over here on the right in the 100th percentile and where your weaknesses are. We always have producers saying, you know, I understand you got all this data, but I'm not in the top 20%. I want to know what they're doing, why I'm not. What, what are they doing differently than me? So these percentile reports really quickly let farmers see, you know, where they're in the top and and where they're not doing as well. So strengths lets them evaluate their strengths and weaknesses, and that can generate all kinds of discussion with their farm consultant or potentially with their lender. So you wonder where all this data comes from and why we support it so strong. We don't do we don't do any of the data gathering at the Center for Farm Financial Management. We are kind of the integrator or the umbrella that pulls the data together. 
The data comes from what we call farm management associations. They take many different forms in different states. Some, in some states, they are connected with the university. In some states, they're connected to two-year community colleges. In some states, they're um, private. They probably were started by an educational organization, but they've spun off and they're totally private. And in some states, they're nonprofit organizations. So again, they're, they're a very mixed structure in how they're organized, but what they do have in common is that almost all of them, they do um, a financial analysis at the end of the year for their members. Most of the, uh, con what we would call an educator or a field mentor or an economist, depending on the state, probably a farm management consultant here, most of them are working with 50 to 100 farms in these farm management associations. The farmers are paying a fee and it ranges anywhere from about $500 up to about $2,000 a year to be part of one of these associations and get the farm management consulting. Um, both cash flow planning, year end analysis, um, talk and discussions about production. Uh, pretty good assistance and consulting from the uh, through these associations. But the year-end year analysis, most of these associations use FinPAC. They generate the year-end analysis with that. That data file then comes into our database, and that's what, where we get this uh, data. And so the 4,000 farms, that data is all coming in from FinPAC. So here's how the data flows. They run FinPAC on an individual farm. You get the individual information. You can discuss that with your consultant. That then flows into a program that we call Rankum which generates a report for that particular group of farmers, let's say it's 50 or 70 farmers within that association. Uh, that can, has a camera ready kind of printable report that they can print out for just that association. They can also run those um, benchmarking, those percentile reports I showed earlier where it highlights the strengths and weaknesses for the, the individual farmers within that group. But then the data flows, that same data file flows up to us and gets put into FinBin and gets put into the larger database. And many farmers then will look at that because then they have many, many, many more uh, producers that they can go in and fine tune their peer group to look at farms that are just doing or operating like they are operating with the same size, uh, same enterprises, and find comparable farms to compare to. So that's uh, our benchmarking. Like I said, we have uh, supported the farm management associations, we've supported the benchmarking efforts very, very strongly over the last couple of decades, trying to build those up and facilitating collaboration between the associations so that they're efficient, they're cost effective, and they can continue to operate because we really do believe that this is one of the best things uh, available to farmers in terms of uh, ways of improving their farm management and their profitability. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how we might use some of our benchmarking data. This is a kind of a condensed report, similar to what I showed earlier, but we dropped two columns out, so it's just got the low profit, high profit, and uh, the middle 20%. And as we look down through this, we see this year in and year out. The low cost or low profit, high profit, low cost producers have the highest yields. So in this site, they got 183 this is bushels per acre, I'm sorry, uh, 183 bushels per acre for the high profit, but they're low cost producers. The low profit, high cost producers, 143 bushels per acre. So you'd think that maybe the cost of production would be higher for those higher yields. It's never the case. They usually have lower costs with higher yields on that top 20%. So here, the seed costs are only slightly lower, $128 per acre versus $129. Then you get to fertilizer, $152 for a low profit but high yield versus $184 and on down. And so you get all the way down here to total cost. It's $200 an acre difference between our higher yielding but low cost producers and the higher cost, lower yielding. You wonder why that is. Uh, and we wonder too. It comes back a lot to management. Yes, there's a little bit about soil uh, quality. There's a little bit about size of operation that plays into these numbers, but mostly it's just management, um, just fine tuning the management. And so that's where the benchmark reports can really help those who aren't doing quite as well, start looking at you know, what is it that those 
better managers or higher yields, lower cost operators are doing that I might be able to start learning from and emulating. So the total cost of production, we have a lot of variation, uh, almost $2 a bushel, and this is for corn, and I transferred that to you cost production on dollars per ton for you Aussies, and that's uh, still quite a, a range in the cost production there on a per ton basis. So again, how we use benchmarking and um, why we consider it so valuable. And so that's where these benchmarking reports become really valuable. Again, I want to know why. I'm a producer. I want to know why my cost production are higher. Let's go into these percentile reports and start looking at it and trying to analyze. Gives the farm consultant all kinds of opportunities to discuss with the producer what's going on. We've also developed a tool that lets individual banks do the same type of benchmarking and analysis just for their bank. So any bank that's using FinPAC has the ability to develop their own internal database similar to what I just showed you. What FinBin is on the web, it's available anybody publicly free of charge. The whole world can go in and look at FinBin. Uh, thousands of tens of thousands of people use FinBin every year to uh, look at the numbers. But the portfolio risk analyst is an add-on to FinPAC just for individual banks. And I want to just go show one other report that we do for banks out of our uh, out of their benchmarking report that we don't actually do uh, in FinBin. And that's called our uh, portfolio stress testing. So I'm going to go up here and just look at this. So this is a group of borrowers for a bank, the entire all the borrowers for that bank or, or whichever ones they've actually run FinPAC on. And it's um, looking at 12 ratios here. And let me just go back to the input for a second and look at um, my shock selection. It lets you set what percent change you want to look at for gross income, operating expenses, interest rates, current and non-current assets. And it lets you combine with and whichever combinations of those you want to look like at in a combined stress test. And then you can also break out what which groups of customers you want to look at. You can look at all of them, or you can look at just particular you know, crop farmers or dairy farmers. You can look at them by size, either gross income, total assets, profitability, uh, debt to asset ratio. So with that, I'm going to go back in here and look at. So this is the, let's just look at term debt coverage ratio. This is the term debt coverage ratio for my entire portfolio of borrowers. I can click on the detail buttons here and bring up all of my borrowers. You may not be familiar with these, but these are all famous baseball players historically in the U.S. Uh, we had to, this is actual farm data. We camouflaged it so you can't tell who it is for farmers. So we renamed them all. Uh, famous baseball players. So if we looked at then a 10% decrease in income, what happens if you know maize or wheat prices go down uh, by t you know, and so we have a 10% decrease in income? What would happen to our portfolio? And the term debt coverage ratio would drop from 5.45 to 2.9. But we can also go in and say which individual farmers might cause our bank a bit of stress and so we can see the ones that would change the most and those are probably the ones that we want to keep a close eye on if things start turning in agriculture and we can do that for operating expenses interest rates change in assets current non ass and non-current assets and then that combined um, stress so I think we had clicked on both a decrease in a gross income and an increase in operating expenses. And so we can see what would happen if both of those things happened. And obviously, if we do enough, we can drive every farm into negative territory. So you have to be a little bit careful with combining. But that's um, we've uh, the benchmarking tools we've developed for individual banks. That's a little bit different than what we have on our public website. Let's switch gears, talk about one of our other tools. Sometimes um, we get fortunate, we build tools 
and they get used by a lot of producers. Sometimes we build tools and almost no one uses them. About seven or eight years ago, we took our soft, our business planning software and made a web, it into a web tool, and we called it AgPlan. And let me go back even further. About 10 to 15 years ago, we started seeing a lot of people writing about how farmers should have a business plan, and we hadn't seen much of that if you go back 20 or 25 years. But So we're getting more and more articles about farmers should have a business plan, but very few people, well, I shouldn't say very few people, there just wasn't a tool available specifically for agriculture for business planning. There are other tools but for non-ag businesses, but nothing for agriculture, and yet people were saying you ought to have a business plan. So we decided to write a business plan with the first one was software, and then we uh, rebuilt it as a web application, called it Ag Plan, and um, it's growing a lot over the last uh, seven, eight years. We've had about 40,000 uh, business plans started in Ag Plan. I always joke and say I don't know how many of them finished their business plan because we can't see the business plans. We never know if they get finished, but at least some of them must have gotten finished out of 40,000. So it's getting a lot of use. It's become a really popular tool in the U.S. if you're developing an agricultural business plan. I thought I'd give a quick overview of it just because um, it's a tool that is available anywhere in the world. I know there's a few people, at least in Australia, that have used it and looked at it. So um, just give you a quick look here at a tool that's free and readily available. So what is a business plan? It's just a, a statement of business goals. The reasons why that we believe or you believe they're attainable and the plan for reaching those goals. And, you know, not every business needs a, a business plan. Not every uh, farm needs a business plan, but some really will benefit from it. I think maybe everyone will benefit from it, but it's particularly valuable for uh, new businesses. If you're looking at expansions, if you're making big changes. So why would a lender or a investor ask you to have a business plan? It really demonstrates that you, the producer, have taken the time to think through all the details of the business and what it takes to make the business succeed, and you're demonstrating that to the investor or lender that you've done that, and you're documenting it. Another reason for a business plan, it becomes a communication tool, and sometimes that's what a business plan is. It's just a communication tool. It's a way of communicating your business both externally and internally, externally to lenders or investors and partners. They can understand your business a lot better internally. Sometimes it's very advantageous to write a business plan just to communicate to the various family members and, and maybe partners within the family or taking parts of the business plan and sharing it with employees so they understand uh, the business and the protocols better. A business plan can really make your business stand out, stand out from the crowd and help you uh, get the financing or get the investment that you may be asking for. But most importantly, a business plan helps the farmer themselves improve the management of their business. It can be the blueprint for operating your business. Just like we need a blueprint for building a building, businesses need an operational guide and a well-written business plan can be and should be an operational guide for a business. Obviously, you can write a business plan, throw it in a drawer, never look at it again, it has limited value for you, unless maybe you just used it to go get a loan one time, Alternatively, you can take a business plan and make it the operational guide for your business and really make it a useful tool. Over the years, working with people writing business plans, we have learned a few things. One of the things we've learned is that business planning can be very time consuming. It often takes two to three months to write a business plan because it takes time to go research uh, options and what's available, uh, getting prices on equipment or buildings or land or whatever it might be. And just all that research takes time and communication takes time. Communicating with family members and other partners and maybe lenders takes time. It's also best done by the business owner or the business manager. You can, at least in the States, we can hire people to write business plans for us. Any farmer can go and hire someone to write a business plan, but as soon as you hire someone else to write a business plan, you pretty much negate all the advantages I just discussed a minute or two ago about why to do a business plan. It doesn't become necessarily your operating guide. It doesn't prove that you've thought through the business. Someone else has thought through the business for you. So um, it's much more advantageous and much more useful if the business owner manager writes the business plan themselves. If you don't write it yourself, it can also get very expensive. It's not uncommon for a business plan to cost ten or fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. 
in the States to have someone write one for you. So what are the major functions of management? You know, we talk about production management, marketing management, personnel management, financial management, and agriculture. So what are the parts of a business plan? The same thing. A business plan basically is talking through those management functions. If you take out the top two sections, executive summary and business description, we the parts of our business plan, the ag plan, business plan outline, is exactly that. It's production or operations. It's marketing, personnel, financial. It's the same. We're just describing the how we're going to manage the major functions of management for that farm. Most people can't or don't write a business plan from scratch. They use software to develop their business plan. It's far easier to do that, and that's, again, why we wrote a plan, to have a plan that's available uh, for farmers, uh, specifically for agriculture. Business planning software provides an outline. It provides uh, sample plans and usually suggestions on the content, which is exactly what Ag Plan does. So let's jump in and look at Ag Plan very quickly. Uh, the first thing you need to do is start a new business plan. And Ag Plan actually has four different templates in it. One is a commodity, traditional egg, selling your commodity to a processor or to uh, an elevator co-op, uh, but you're just selling the commodity. The, the second one is value-added egg. That's where you're adding value, you're processing, you're um, direct marketing to consumers. Doing, You're not just selling the commodity. And then it has a small business uh, template in it. You know, Many producers have other businesses on the side, so it does have a small business uh, template. And we had a big project with commercial fishing, so there's a commercial fishing template in it also. So you select the template you want. They are different. There's different sections different tips, different sample plans for these four different templates. So once you've selected a business plan, you come in and this would be the uh, template for, um, in this case, it's actually for a commercial fishing operation. Sorry about that. But it's the same, very similar to what you would see for a, an ag business. So on the left, is the outline. This is what changes depending on the template you select. There's the six big sections, executive summary, business description, operations, marketing, personnel, and finance, and then lots of subsections underneath those. We always talk about how you never, no one uses, almost no one uses all the subsections. Pick and choose the ones that are relative, relevant to your business. Let the rest go. Uh, it does change. The subsections change depending on the template that you choose. Over here on the upper right is the work area. This is where you type. It's a word processor. You can type whatever you want. It has a lot of the functionality across the top that Word has, so you can cut, copy, paste, insert photos, um, create tables, bullets, numbers, all those types of things. Make your plan look nice. At the bottom are all the things to help you write a plan. So we have tips, resources, samples, and comments. I'll talk through those quickly. First one is tips. Those are kind of suggestions or questions for each section of the plan. Resources are just links to articles that might help you with each section. Not every section has resources, but some do. This one's on a promotion. So how to promote your product if you're direct marketing. And it just has a few articles there you might read if you want to learn more about that. Sample business plans are obviously what they sound like. They're just sample business plans from real farmers, but they um, have been sanitized so you can't figure out who they're from. Finally, comments. The unique thing about Eggplant versus other off-the-shelf uh, business planning software that you can buy is that we let you give access to the business plan to anyone you want to. So if you start a business plan, you can choose to go back, and we call them my, my reviewers. They could be, you could call them my advisors or consultant, whatever you want to call them, but we just name them my reviewers. You can just type in someone's email address. So let's say it's, you're working with your farm management consultant type in their email address, choose to give them comment only rights or actually editing rights where they can help write your business plan or, or edit your business plan. Click add reviewer, they'll get an email say you've added them on as a reviewer and at that point they have access to your business plan. They can see your business plan and they can come in and review it and make comments and you can email back and forth. So if you've just worked on a section and you want someone to look at it, just send an email, and if you had multiple reviewers, they'd all be listed there. You could choose which ones to send the email to, and then they can come in and work on it and comment back to you. 
we were struggling a few years ago with how do you help people actually finish a business plan? You know, it takes a couple months. Most people don't necessarily finish it uh, without some encouragement. So that's why we created this uh, My Reviewer feature. You can generate a business plan, your business plan, either as a Word document or as a PDF. It creates a nice cover page outline uh, for you, and you can add attachments as many as you want. So that's Ag Plan, a quick uh, overview of a tool that may or may not be useful to you, but I wanted to show it to you just in case uh, you want to use it. We've built a tool very similar called Ag Transitions, and I'm just going to click down to it. It's built on the same platform as Ag Plan. Uh, it functions the same way, but it's a transition plan to help producers transition the farm to the next generation. Uh, we have, as I just showed, in the United States, over 650,000 producers who are over 65 years old. Uh, and you certainly should probably start thinking about your transition plan to the next generation prior to being 65 years old. So we may have as many as a million farmers who could benefit, certainly won't develop one, but could benefit from a transition plan. So it's a topic of high interest in the U.S., and I think it's very similar here in Australia. So this is just a tool that could help uh, as you're working with producers to develop a transition plan. So I've talked briefly about the growing financial stress and some of the tools that we use in the states or will use in the states uh, to help farmers with financial stress. I just very briefly mentioned transitioning farmers. Uh, beginning farmers, I didn't touch on a lot. Um, we are going to um, encourage beginning farmers to write a business plan. We've also developed a, uh, we're just in the process of developing a new website, kind of a, uh, what's called a clearinghouse, a kind of a centralized place for beginning farmers to go to, to get information and to uh, connect with other beginning farmers and developing a toolbox of tools for them. It's called farmanswers.org. Um, that's something that the Center for Farm Financial Management is also working on. But as we conclude today, and I want to just talk about some of the challenges with what I've talked about and how we're the challenges we're looking at as a center. Obtaining data is always a challenge, whether it's from those farm management associations or for a financial plan uh, using FinPAC or any other type of um, tool that you're using. Getting the data is always a challenge. So that is an ongoing challenge of how to efficiently help farmers gather data and get it into uh, tools that can help them uh, without just overwhelming them with data requests. Still working on that. Uh, that's just something we're facing. Integrating data and tools. Uh, more and more society is getting used to really, really fast tools through apps on their phones or their iPads or whatever it might be. And, um, we're finding that the ability to grab data from other sources, bring it into your tool or into your application is becoming an uh, ex expectation. Let me give you an example. In the States, TurboTax is used by about 60% of all for all of tax returns. In TurboTax, you push a button and it goes and with your authorization goes and grabs your earnings for the year from your employer and just dumps them right into your tax return. Another push of the button, it goes to your bank gets all the information from your bank, puts it into your tax return. It's so efficient, and it's, this integration of data is happening, and people are starting to expect it. And we have not built that into the agricultural tools uh, much at all yet, but it's becoming an expectation. And that leads me to the third point here, the speed and cost development uh, to do those kinds of things in agriculture with a smaller audience is going to be an ongoing challenge. So those are some of the things that we're looking at as challenges. Thanks for joining us today. Um, if you have questions, we'll take questions here at the end. Uh, uh, once again, appreciate your participation and um, look forward to visiting with you as we go forward. Thanks much.